Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Chris Grant and I'm Partnerships Manager here at Digital Construction Skills. And today I'm absolutely delighted to have on the podcast Dave Emery. Dave Emery is an architectural technologist with more than 40 years experience. He has spoken in front of thousands of people over the last decade about BIM, DFMA and off-site construction. After 15 years with his own company, Vertex Limited, he recently joined the Supply Chain Sustainability School as their off-site and digital consultant. Dave, I'm absolutely thrilled to have you in the podcast, so you're very welcome. Thank you, Chris. That's a very nice welcome. Very pleased to be here and talk to you today. Great, great. And, and today, Dave, we're, we're just going to get right into it and we're going to talk about the golden thread of information, BIM and digital transformation. And what does that mean specifically for the construction SME sector and why we should all be paying attention to it? So, so Dave, can we just talk us through in simple terms then, what do we mean by the golden thread of information? You know, and why is it important for the whole supply chain to really understand what this means, including the smaller contractors? Well, uh, Chris, golden thread of information for me is having information that uh, starts to be provided and developed really in the very early stages of building at inception and design stage can usefully be used throughout the design stage and into procurement, into construction, and most importantly, into managing that asset. Um, the, the phrase golden thread has, has rather become synonymous with the Grenfell inquiry, which I want to steer very much away from. Mm -hmm. But my own experience of um, a golden thread, as it were, came a few years ago, working with a very large tier one contractor that is no longer in business. So your listeners may be able to guess which one that was. But the concept of the project was that, that they were to deliver a, a 300 million pound hospital project. And um, they were not only constructing this building, but they were uh, going to design it, deliver it, and crucially operate it for 30 years. So you can see that if they got great information at the start of that project, which could be used in the asset management phase, there were some huge advantages there. Yeah. Now, potentially some of those advantages could have been in terms of uh, specifying products, for example. So very often in our industry, we are inclined to buy on lowest price wins. But actually, if you have a contract where you are responsible for that asset for 30 years, you might think that actually in the long run, it might be better for me to uh, supply more expensive, but better uh, longer lasting uh, objects and products to benefit in the long term. So uh, my experience in, the, in that project was to try and uh, ascertain exactly what information would be needed at design stage, construction phase and operations phase, and then communicate that to the SME suppliers in the region, all of whom obviously were delighted to have a £300 million project yes. on their doorstep. <laughs> so so that, that, that's great. So, 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 so did, did you get engagement then with the, with the, the smaller contractors on that project? What was your experiences of, of that project then? Yes, I did. So um, very cunningly, the local authority in the region, I, I'm in the industrial black country here in the, in the West Midlands, mm -hmm. and this project was going to be one of the most significant projects for some years. So the local authority in whose borough the hospital was or is being built um, somehow managed to ring fence a quite substantial amount of money from the tier one contractor, which they then used, uh, well, effectively to pay me to help the local supply chain. Mm. So uh, it was my job to work for the tier one contractor to interpret their digital requirements into plain language that local small SMEs could understand, if you like. So, uh, there was a, a, an award-winning innovation that the local authority came up with, which was called the West Midlands Virtual Hospital. And the idea was this was um, a portal, if you like, where local companies could not only upload their uh, the details of their business and their capabilities, but actually they could tell us what is your knowledge of BIM and digital. And we asked them to be really honest because if they felt that their knowledge was poor that would enable us to help them and support them and increase their understanding of digital and of course what we found was that most small companies initially said oh yes we're four star and five star because they thought that would help them win business yes. uh -huh. uh, so that was the first piece of communication with smes 
So I spent, uh, gosh, I don't know how, how long, probably 12 months or more running uh, BIM workshops for SMEs, for local suppliers, to try and actually demystify it and, and make it understandable to, to the average person and, and, and not the, uh, the computer geeks that some of us are. <laughs> well, Joe, as, you know, I've, I've just dived right into this and, and I was meant to ask you a question, first of all, about, about BIM. What is BIM? Let's, let, let's go wind back a bit and we'll come back onto that thread again in a minute. So, so you know, what, what, do, what, you know, what do the BIM standards encompass and why do we have them in the first place? Well, let, let's define BIM. Uh, the acronym stands for Building Information Modelling. I prefer to think of it as um, virtual construction. And indeed, when I was first managing what are now called BIM projects, it, it was called virtual construction. So what we're trying to do is create a, a digital representation of the project, the building, not only in terms of a 3D model, but actually the crucial thing is that model contains lots of useful information. That's the I in BIM. And uh, that information can vary. It can be almost infinite. So it could be, for example... I don't know, product reference numbers. It could be um, performance aspects of an element. So if we if we have a lintel, it could be the, the load-bearing capacity of that lintel. It could contain health and safety sheets. It could contain operator information. So there's all uh, an infinite amount of uh, I in BIM, infinite amount of information that you can put in. And that's really to come to the... Uh, answer the question Chris is why it's really important that we have standards because unless we um, uh, computers don't like variations in, in descriptions of things so we need to understand exactly how we describe objects and components and elements and also we need to understand uh, who does what in a BIM environment because the essence of a successful BIM project is that we collaborate so we need to understand our roles and responsibilities. Um, and we need to actually adopt um, a collaborative mindset to, to, to make BIM work. So, right. I, I, OK, so that's some really big, big, big themes there. Then. So so maybe, you know, you, you were just talking about that big project. So maybe we we'll go revisit that then. Is that the type of project you're thinking this is most useful for? Yeah, is, it, is it just that mega 300 million pound project or is it? The three million pound project. What 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 are they? What is it most useful for, and why? Or what what's your? What's your well, I, I I personally, if I go back to my initial role as 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 a designer, architectural technologist. So if I'm talking about uh, the what we call the BIM authoring tools, the tools that we use to create these designs, there are huge benefits uh, even for small architectural practices. So if you can conceive of uh, the architectural world when I joined it in the 1970s, when we used drawing boards and pens and ink and we scratched out our mistakes with a razor blade and an eraser, um, to, to, um, to describe a building on paper, you would need to draw the plans, you would need to draw elevations, draw sections. I remember with fondness uh, spending days writing out door schedules on a stencil on tracing paper hundreds of doors with every last detail and all that used to work until it came time that something changed and then every single document would need to be manually changed and, and that of course is when the coordination would break down on a, on a project so you would have a plan describing something in one way and an elevation would show it somewhere else now, fast forward to the 3D digital world that I now work in. I create a model of the building, but my drawings, my outputs, if you like, my views of that model are generated by the computer. So a plan is a vertical view looking down. A section is a horizontal view looking sideways, similarly with, a, with an elevation. And the schedules are produced by the computer. Now, the key point here is that anything that I change in that model automatically updates all the documents that reference it so the the upfront work is rather more intensive but in terms of producing documentation bim is an absolute wonder so we, we, we it's transformed the way i work and interestingly when i was employed pre-2006 i had a team of five people um in the days when we used to work in 2d 
And my proposition to them was, I'm going to learn this 3D BIM stuff. Uh, give me six months head start and then I'll, I'll train you guys. And what happened was, whereas all five of us used to work on projects together collaboratively, the other guys were very slow to embrace BIM. And in fact, they rejected it. It seemed too complicated to them. So my team split into two, which was me on my own and the four others working collaboratively. The point was I was producing enough, uh, the same amount of work from one BIM program as four of them were producing from traditional 2D techniques. Wow. So for designers, absolutely great. But actually, the, the BIM isn't all about the model. BIM is all about um, other kinds of information and, and who can actually usefully use that information. And that could be the procurement teams. It could be estimators. It could be asset management teams. So the, the essence of a great BIM project for me is to provide the information that's needed for any particular stakeholder at the time he or she needs it. But that needs lots of great organisation and standards to work to. Yeah, and I think going back to uh, what perhaps what I didn't answer, Chris, was that no, BIM isn't just for mega projects, not at all. Um, I've used it on, I think the smallest um, project I used BIM for was um, some laboratories that were sent down to Antarctica, which sounds really exotic, but actually they were converted shipping containers. So we actually modelled the shipping containers first of all, but because they were research laboratories, they were full of lots of uh, equipment, electrical equipment, computer cable runs and so on. And we actually modelled all those so that they could be coordinated because they, these were being built in a factory. So in terms of the size of the project, uh, I, I don't have a, a minimum threshold. Okay. Well, you're, you're, you're kind of leading on to the next question, really, what I was, was going to ask you then. Well, what does an excellent BIM project look like from, like from top to bottom? I think you've kind of started to, to hint there what that might look like, but have you got any specific examples you can share with us? And you know, what, the, what were the key ingredients that made the project successful? Um, yeah, yeah, an excellent BIM project, sorry, yes. Uh, an excellent BIM project for me is one that um, provides information where it's needed and when it's needed. Um, I'll give you a great example of well, the other part of that question is, what does it require? And it actually requires um, a collaborative approach and it requires um, inputs from a number of people. And I'll give you a great example of where it went wrong. I worked with a, a fairly large construction company who were interested in exploring BIM and uh, invited me in to talk to them about it. And I rather bravely uh, offered to model a live project they were tendering. And this was just before Christmas. And I was fairly new into my own business and thought that actually working Christmas and New Year was a good thing to do. So I said, I'll come back after Christmas uh, with, with this project modelled and uh, let's see what benefits you can derive from it. And the story was when I went back, um, I'd made certain assumptions about things which were incorrect and i hadn't fully appreciated how their estimators went about estimating things so i'd spent time doing things that were unnecessary and conversely i'd not done things that would have been useful to them and a very quick example was uh, the project was a, a seven story um, uh, concrete car park in a steel frame so i had modeled all the steel columns in a story by story basis so for each at each point i got seven columns one on top of the other from an estimator's point of view he just needs to know the total weight of the steel single column would have been easy and there were lots of other things like that uh, another one was the uh, circulation areas for pedestrians were color coded on each floor so i'd carefully created the correct paint shade and shown it on around the lift shafts and the stairs Again, from an estimator's point of view, paint is paint. It's the same price, whether it's yeah. pink or blue. So what, what that taught me was that actually you need to bring these people in to help you develop the model. So it's no good me as a designer making assumptions about what an estimator wants or what a project manager wants or what a quantity surveyor wants. Actually, it needs to be a collaborative effort by these people to input into the project. 
And a few years later, I worked with um, a great team of, I think, around 24 of us, engineers, architects, landscape consultants, acoustics people. And there, we together created that model. It may have been me and a few other architectural people actually working the computer, but actually we drew on their knowledge and experience so that the information we did put in was useful to them. So a great BIM project is one with really useful data that can be used by the whole team. Right. Okay, so I think, again, this is kind of leading on lovely to the, the next question here as well. You know, it's just really get maybe to really interested to hear about that, you know, about how the subcontractors and maybe the lower end of the supply chain and how they were involved with the process there. So so it sounded like you got you get really down to the, the kind of the, the, the small details there and got them bought into that project from, from a, certainly from an architectural point of view, and, and getting that right. But how did that then manifest itself then and, uh, you know, when it came to the actual delivery side of things then, Dave? Was it, what, you know? Yeah, the, I, I mean, and some of my experiences have been good and bad. So, um, well, first of all, I think as far as SMEs are concerned, it's always been my ambition to demystify BIM and, and actually take away the fear of it being a huge, complex process. Mm -hmm. And frankly, in, in, in the BIM world, um, much of what a manufacturer, even a small, modest manufacturer, an SME type company might produce is a perfectly valid input into a BIM model. So, for example, if you've got um, PDF brochures and data sheets and health and safety data sheets, those are perfectly valid inputs into a, a BIM model. It doesn't necessarily need to be that you're going to create a 3D representation of what you build. Yes. yes. However, if you do decide that's a way forward, then that can make your business very much more attractive to the customer. So going back to my earlier point of uh, me as the modeler, as it were, trying to input data into this thing, I, I, I don't have the specialist knowledge about the SME's product to be able to embed all that manually into a model. And frankly, life's too short for me to do that. <laughs> So, it, it, you know, if the SME can come up with a, a digital representation of what they build, and it doesn't need to be massively um, geometrically correct, you know, it can be a fairly simple visual model. But if it's got the correct data in it, and you can give it to me and I can drop it into the model, gosh, that makes you more attractive to me and the yeah, contractor. Yeah. So, so it's really just getting that what you do and just represent it digitally uh, you know in basic simple terms that's what we're just you know it's just you know it's no different you're just physically what you're representing in real life it's just finding a way just to represent that in a, in a way that can be presented to you and just dropped in and you just take care of that after that for that basically uh, indeed and what, what i've found in in running lots of workshops is that um if you talk to your customer and you talk to your own suppliers and actually figure out what what information could be transmitted digitally or could be shared between you, you may find that this information is already available. You just never thought yeah. of connecting the dots. Yeah. And one of the other concerns that I think SMEs have about creating um, digital components is uh, the worry about plagiarism. In other words, we're giving all our IP away uh -huh. in, in a model and I must tell you a story about a workshop I ran where I was suggesting to some SMEs that they might instead of um, working in 2D they might want to create some 3D representations of what they do and and one guy in the audience said well actually um, there would be a risk if I did that I'm giving away all my IP because somebody could just take my model and rebrand it as their own so I said well what what do you do now when you transmit a document? Surely that's in PDF format. He said, well, yes, it is. And I said, well, isn't that giving away your IP? And he said, oh, no, 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 I, I, I don't design things. I go and grab something off the internet and then send that out. <laughs> so <laughs> there's definitely a change in mindset needed among some of the smaller yeah. SMEs. Right, well, well, maybe just like this spend a wee second on that. How does that work in terms of the IP? You know, just, you know, generally speaking, how does that work when you're a subcontractor and I give you, I've, I've got a 3D model of this room that you're going to re recreate and you, and you know as a retrofit or whatever, uh, and I've put on where I'm putting new windows or it's a, it's a new product or something like that. Um, how does that actually work then? You know, how, you know, in terms of the IP, 
Who owns that then? First of all, you need to think about what what is your IP? What 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 in your intellectual property? What what is it? And there's a great example in the offsite world, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit later. But um, I've worked with a number of offsite manufacturers, and in essence, if they're building volumetric modules, in other words, things like hotel rooms and student accommodation, what you buy from them is a box, which is a room, a pre-manufactured room. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, several manufacturers and the Department of Education and a couple of architects got together to see if we could standardize across the industry the type of components we use in, in this type of building for lots of reasons, which we may touch on later. But it became clear that the offsite manufacturers regarded their IP as, uh, you know, the way they put the bits of cold steel together and the way they, you know, the particular brand of insulation they use between the posts and, and you know, the, the membranes. And actually, there's not really any intellectual property in that thing. It, it, you know, you're all using broadly similar components. So I, I don't think it's as much an intellectual property issue as m more one of branding. So I think, first of all, you need you need to decide what what is it you're actually trying to protect. Now, even if you decide that um, there is something unique about your project, I would suggest that if you do create a digital version of that, it's very easy to embed your copyright and to embed your branding and your company name in that component in such a way that it can't be um, edited or taken out. And then anybody seeing that component or hundreds of those components in the model, once they're scheduled, there is your company name uh, and your branding and your model numbers in that schedule. So I think, in fact, your IP, such as it is, can actually be better protected in a model than, than in a, the old-fashioned 2D world. Right. Uh, and I guess then, they, I mean, the whole point of the, the, you know, it's not about taking your IP, it's more about we need this information to run and operate the, the building essentially for 30, 40, 50 years. That, that's, that's the main driver behind it. There's no, there's no um, kind of conspiracy here to try and to, to, to take stuff pe from people. But, but again, of course, you've got to think about EIP. We're not, we're not dismissing it. Um, you know, you've obviously got to think about that. But again, it's, with the right advice, um, it, it, it can be overcome. Basically, that, that shouldn't be a blocker anyway. That's what we're saying. No, no, it shouldn't. Uh, and also, I think, you know, at some stage, um, as a supplier or a manufacturer, you're going to give your uh, information to the project because mm -hmm. that's what you have to do. I think the question, the nervousness comes in giving up that information early on in the project. Mm -hmm. Now, in both the BIM world that I operate in and in the offsite world that I operate in, this sense of early engagement being really crucial um, is sometimes um, difficult to achieve because of contractual issues and worries. So if you haven't been appointed and you haven't yet got the order, why are you going to give up your intellectual property? And I know that's a concern for a lot of companies. So we, we need to trust each other. We need to collaborate better. I will give you an example of where this went very wrong, which was um, a project I was involved with. Um, in fact, let's be frank, it was the same project I was talking about earlier, where um, a local company who was able to supply, let me describe it as a, a very significant package in, in the overall um, scheme of things, worked very closely with the contractor to develop a BIM componentry attended all the coordination meetings and so on. Um, and I remember uh, receiving the call from their managing director who was absolutely apoplectic with rage because somebody in the tier one had clearly seen the phrase or other approved and placed an order with a company in Portugal. So that, that to me really did an enormous amount of harm in terms of uh, trust and collaboration. So, Dale, so, so Dave, just David, we're just talking there about the, the SMEs in, and so what digital tools did they use to help them? You know, how did they get the skills and knowledge required to engage with the BIM process? Now, so you were, you were, you kind of touched on the workshops and things like that you done on a project in the past. So, so maybe just like you know, maybe go into a bit more detail. 
Yeah, I think um, many SMEs coming to the workshops when we started to talk about them creating good digital information for a BIM model had this fear that they would have to go out and invest in very expensive BIM authoring tools. Uh, and they're not only expensive to buy, but they're expensive in terms of the huge learning curves. Um, and really, for an SME to engage with BIM authoring tools to create a few objects is really impractical. And you'll be pleased to hear, largely unnecessary. So as I said earlier, lots of digital information you've already got can successfully be embedded in the project by the BIM manager. But if you are an SME and you, you have got a product range you'd like to digitize into BIM models, there are companies that will help you with that. Sure, there's an investment, but it's significantly less than you going away and trying to author your own tools. So the lights of the NBS library, uh, BIM object uh, will help you by creating digital representations of what you've got. They'll quality assure the data in there with you. And frankly, they're some of the world's biggest platforms for this kind of BIM object. So I would suggest they would open up your product range to the world, in fact, uh, in the case uh, of BIM object. Yeah, right. So that's something you may want to consider. So, so again, there's there's that other thing about opening your you know that's the thing that you you put that information on a platform that other people can can see then and, and, and maybe open you up to a new a new audience and, and maybe that's is, is that is that the kind of spin offs of BIM then because that was maybe something I was going to talk about you know are these the benefits the other benefits you can realise from BIM you know you know it's not just that I oh god we've got to create a model it's like you know there's, there's other things I that come out yeah. of that as well. I often, um, I've been speaking to the industry off and on probably for 15 to 20 years about uh, virtual construction, about BIM, about modern methods of construction. In other words, everything I speak to the industry about is trying to invoke change. And I must say that uh, many of my audiences have, have met my proposals with a, either ambivalence or apathy, no aggression overtly yet. But, you know, this is an industry that's a little bit um, resistant to change but i always try and say to companies you know it's not my role really to tell you that you must do things differently you may very well have a successful business that you know i've worked for in a company that was fifth generation you know that was literally started in victorian times and and they've made a really successful business but i always say to business owners what will your business look like if you do nothing if you don't change anything what would your business look like in a year or three years or five years or 10 years? You know, what will a legacy be of the decisions you make today, whether that's to stay as you are or actually embrace the change that is coming in the industry at last? How does your company appear to potential clients if it carries on doing what it's always done compared to actually embracing digital change and trying to innovate and become for, more forward thinking? I think from a, a client's perspective, there will be huge value in having building projects that are laden with useful data. And if you can't or won't contribute to that pool of data, you may find your market narrowing somewhat over the next few years. So I'm not saying you've got to change. I just ask you to think about what will your business look like if you never change? Good advice there, David. Um, so, Dave, you're, you're involved with an organisation called BIM for Housing. Can you tell us a little bit about BIM for Housing? You know, what do they do and how do they help the construction SME businesses in that sector? Sure. Um, BIM for Housing is a really interesting organisation and uh, it's been brought together. Um, it, it comprises a number of people from different parts of the industry, from me as a, a designer and trainer, to product manufacturers, to architects, to contractors. And really we're trying to see how we can help the housing sector uh, modernize, if you like, and how can we improve the design and delivery and, and operation of buildings and, and how we, can we foster a more collaborative approach to those aspects? The part that I'm particularly uh, involved with is what's known as the MMC Workstream, the Modern Methods of Construction. 
So um, I believe that if we're ever to meet the housing need, um, we need to do things differently. Uh, I've been involved in housing since the early 1980s. And I think every year that I've been involved with it, some government report or other tells us that there's been a shortfall. So it's pretty nigh on 40 years now. We've we consistently failed to deliver the number of buildings that we need to. So I believe the, uh, the industry and that sector in particular needs a radical new approach. And I see modern methods of construction and offsite as um, a potential solution to uh, faster delivery in higher volume to much higher standards. And I think to underpin uh, a kind of factory made solution, we definitely need uh, digital design and, and BIM. Right, okay. Um, I think we're going to come on to that actually very, very shortly actually. So we'll, we'll, we'll um, but I, again, I suppose I'm just looking at, you know, are there any lessons that other sectors can learn from what you've been doing there just now in the, in, in the BIM for housing? You know, are there good practices in relation to engaging with smaller contractors that could be replicated across different sectors? Is it the MMC way or is it other things? Or what, 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 are the, what are the key things you think you're, you know, you're moving forward with just now that are really some... Well, first of all, I think it's important to say that, uh, in my opinion, actually the, the housing sector is probably the least likely to embrace BIM and embrace change. And I say that because, as we've spoken about already this morning, um, many of the benefits of a, of a great digital model uh, are realised in the operational phase of that building. And I go back to my Tier 1 contractor's hospital, just as a little side story the previous hospital they built they had to supply handover information to the local health service and that was probably in the form of pdf files on cds uh, and literally shopping bags full of um, manufacturers uh, instructions but they, they calculated that just that exercise to assemble and transmit that data cost them a third of a million pounds that's just a little side story the difficulty in the housing sector, of course, is that most house developers are only interested in that building up to the point of sale and through the two year warranty period. So they don't have an intrinsic interest in having that data in the operational phase. Yes, there's, um, there are opportunities perhaps uh, to hand over good digital data to your purchaser. And I see a, um, a scenario in the quite near future where your customer will probably be able to operate that building on a tablet or from their phone and research um, information about you know the service and maintenance requirements of the building on their phone but i don't think we're there yet in the housing sector so i do think housing is probably the last uh, sector to actually really have an interest in bim they possibly have an interest at the earlier stages because one of the other benefits of modeling your project is a byproduct is some great visualizations, fly throughs, marketing material and so on. So I think there's scope there. And finally, there are examples of great practice in the offsite sector, where as a consumer, you can actually go on to a developer's website and specify your new home in the same way that we've become used to uh, configuring our new car or our dream new cars on some websites the, there's a beginning now that a customer can figure their new home but it, clearly that relies on some sort of digital representation of the building so i think perhaps that's uh, the, the the house builder's interest is probably more in the early stages rather than the using the maintenance data later on okay so 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 before we move on then so, so you were talking so the bigger projects then that, 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 that use this handover and asset map. So uh, are they are they getting the benefits that, that, that you know running these projects now? I mean, have you revisited some of the projects? You know, the early BIM projects. You know, on the bigger maybe infrastructure side. Then, you know, what what is the key benefits for the client? You know, are they operating it properly, or um, do they need training, or have they used the information properly? I think that's what I'm trying to get at. You know. Yeah, well, I think the answer is that um, yes and no. I think for me, the 
uh, the key aspect will be when the data embedded in the model can integrate directly with the building owner's FM systems. And I think the nearest we've got at the moment is a concept called digital twinning. So a, a, a model, um, it, 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 it's used for different purposes from through different parts of the design, procurement, construction and delivery phase. But a, but a model that used for construction ultimately may well change and become something called an asset information model, an AIM. And this, if you can imagine now, you've got a, a digital representation of your real building. So uh, that's where the twinning part comes in. So what we hope is that any alterations that you make to the real building will be fed back into the digital model so that you've always understand from the digital model what's in your real building. Now, some of the advantages of that are that you, if you are considering uh, alterations or changes to the building, you could now start to simulate those changes and see what would be the consequence maybe to, I don't know, the heating and ventilation system. How many more people could you accommodate? Is there load bearing capacity in the structure if you put another story on and so on? So we, I think asset information models and digital twinning are as far as the industry has gone yet. I think though there is another phase that won't be far away, which is when we start to interconnect the knowledge we have about our digital world uh, so that we have a, a bigger picture of what's going on. Now, great example, I was talking recently uh, to the rail sector and they uh, clearly have lots of physical assets in terms of stations and platforms and track, but they also embedding digital information in their assets, which are the, the trains that run up and down the track. And they see a scenario very soon where if a train full of people is arriving for a major event in a city, that data is transmitted to the station so we can be sure there are enough open gates and staff to man them. We can be sure that the vending machines have got sufficient snacks in them. We can be sure that there are sufficient Uber drivers outside the station to pick up this swell of passengers. So you can see that we're, we're on the threshold of a much bigger digital integration of our environment. So I'm passionate that we, we really get to grips with, with BIM here now and today, so that we, we're kind of ready for this much wider integrated digital future. That's quite an exciting glimpse of the future there, David, there, what you've just, you know, I, I, never, I never thought about it in that way, but yeah, that's that's quite quite interesting to see that. And, and I, I guess there'll be people quite determined to, to, to move forward with that, because obviously the, there's so much that can reap in terms of other information, how we design society, but God, we could, we could go on and get into a, a, a philosophy discussion here after this. So we'll, we'll go back yeah. to the the, 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 the the topic at hand here. But no, that, that's that's a really good insight there. Um, Dave, you, you 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 touched on modern methods of construction there. So maybe just tell us briefly what that is then, and how is BIM then a useful tool for managing this process? You know, and what opportunities there uh, for for businesses to move into that 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 space? You know, to, to emerge like new new type of businesses, new new construction businesses. I think you touched on the, the housing sector there. That might be a way a lot of offsite manufacturing. And so, what's that space looking like? And uh, modern methods of construction uh, and offsite construction, I, I find really exciting at the moment. It's uh, something I've worked in for in excess of ten years, and uh, now work heavily with the Supply Chain Sustainability School. Think of modern methods of construction in a nutshell, I think, are it, 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 really it's any sort of innovation that Im, improves process and cuts out waste. But I think traditionally we think of it as, um, in essence, building in a factory. There's more to it than that, of course, but it's actually prefabricating as much of the building as we can. I think if you if you imagine what our industry is capable of, if you think about what it does and what it achieves, it, it delivers some of the most complex, massive projects that the world's ever seen in conditions of absolutely awful uh, weather and site constraints, um, underground difficulties, and yet it's capable of delivering some amazing projects. 
at its best. At, at its worst, um, it's inefficient, it's wasteful, it's not profitable, and it doesn't improve the environment. And I think if we can start to take as much of the building away from the hostile environment of a building site into a factory, then we can we can improve the speed of delivery. We can certainly improve the quality of the product. We can uh, have people working in a much less hostile environment. And there are so many advantages to MMC. I think it's inevitable it will prevail. But actually, you know, modern method of construction has existed for decades. It's rather a misnomer to think of it as a 21st century innovation. You know, I could make a case that the Empire State Building was a modern method of construction. So I think it, if you are an SME that currently supplies to what I call the traditional construction industry, you might want to sit up and think about uh, MMC and modern methods of construction, in particular off-site construction. So it may be that uh, if you're a subcontractor or a supplier, you're working on a, a project by project basis. As each project ends, you geographically have to move or supply to another location. Whereas actually, if you can form um, business relationships now with um, off-site or factory manufacturers, it could be actually you've got a, a greater continuity of supply. It could be that your logistics are much simpler because you're supplying to a single location. It could be that your um, your, your workflow, your your uh, pipeline is smoothed out because you're now dealing with a manufacturer who is consistently producing goods and consistently needs your product. Therefore, so I think for the SME um, off-site construction and modern methods of construction offer some really exciting opportunities. Certainly to take out those those peaks and troughs in terms of delivery and uh, pipeline for you. We're we'll kind of wrap up a wee bit now, but um, um, you know, what would be what would your advice be then to get started? Maybe around modern methods of construction or or, or, or using digital tools of your construction SME. What what is the next step you would take? You know, if you're looking to try and you know grow your business and, and, and move into the the great unknown, as uh, maybe if it's a great unknown for you, what would that be? Well, Chris, this is going to sound awfully like. Um, a shameless advertisement for the supply chain sustainability school but I, I hand on heart um, I would say go and have a look at what we in the school can do to help you just as a, a quick 30 second elevator pitch about what the school is um, it was established uh, about 10 years ago when a number of tier one contractors felt that it would be good for the industry as a whole if they could in some way help upskill the whole of the supply chain and from that germ of an idea the school was born so currently it has around about 140 partners comprising all the major construction companies you've ever heard of the top 10 house building companies people like highways england and other institutions all pay significant amounts of money into the school for which they retreat, uh, receive training and support but more importantly it enables us to develop materials that we can train um, the entire supply chain free of charge at the point of use so there's a vast repository of learning materials about off-site mmc digital and, and a vast range of other topics but one of the great advantages is that the learning you receive is customized to where you are now and what you do know now and again, significantly is once you go through any learning with the school, you receive a sort of digital badge or a tick against your name and against your company. And that can reassure those major customers of yours who are also partners of the school that you are a creditable, uh, well-trained individual or company. So the short answer, Chris, goes <laughs> to the Supply Chain Sustainability School and, and just, just absorb the free learning that's there because unless you understand what opportunities are there, you, you really can't make decisions about the direction your business needs to take. It's been created by the industry for the industry and it's with, with, with people like yourself right behind that and uh, I think it's nice to have a, put a face to like people who's, who's involved in these kind of big platforms and not to be scared and you know and, and hearing you talk today it's been I've, I've, really, I've, I've really, it's one of, been one of the most enjoyable conversations I've had some great conversations in the past though, but I must admit but I've really really been this has been a very valuable uh, 
discussion this morning. So that's been a tremendous overview, David. And I really, I really wanted to maybe actually just exactly that talk about the supply chain school and what you do a bit more detail maybe at some point maybe in the future again maybe talk about net zero because it feels like net zero is, is a sustainability is it's almost overtaken BIM but the thing is it's like it's all part of the the journey we've all got to get, get to grips of all these new co kind of maybe relatively new concepts for people so um, it's not one over the other it's just like taking that holistic approach and you know it's um, it's an exciting time to be constructed David I think I, I absolutely agree. I always say to people, I've, it's 45 years I've been in this industry this year. And for 40 of those, I've seen this industry doggedly hold on to its old ways. But actually, in the last few years, I've seen an appetite for change. And I agree with you. It is the most exciting time ever to have been in this industry. That's been absolutely brilliant. And uh, I'll catch up with you again soon, David. Thank you. Cheers. Absolute pleasure, Chris. Thank you very much.